made a mistake of not introducing you earlier. I did note that in the program you are listed as from OJP, Open Government Partnership. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, Bruce is a seasoned U.S. Uh, senior official. Uh, he is a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public Diplomacy uh, and has a wealth of experience in public diplomacy throughout the world. So whenever, if ever you should have serious issues to raise about OGP, he's not the man to shout at, but he will relay your message to <laughs> <laughs> to people who will uh, address those concerns regarding OGP. Um, what Bruce mentioned earlier was the issue of uh, eligibility requirements or qualification criteria, and as you may well expect, having an access to information legislation uh, improves or increases the chances of a country joining an OGP. But uh, this has been a major challenge in Africa, where a number of senior government officials have said to us as activists, that there isn't an indigenous uh, reference point for drafting an access to information legislation taking into consideration the African context. It is uh, in response to this uh, concern that the African Commission on Human and People's Rights um, initiated the process of drafting a model law for African Union uh, states. I would therefore like to introduce uh, Ms. Temi Okona from the South African History Archive, who is one of the drafters of the African Union's Model Law on Access to Information. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I wanted to thank Professor Berger for allowing me to come and tell you about this initiative, which is being led by uh, Commissioner Papula who is the African Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression and Access to Information. Um, in the time available, there's not really time for me to actually tell you about the law itself. So instead, I'm going to talk to you about the process and the reason for the law, and also encourage you to get involved and talk to you about how you can get involved in finalising what will be the content of the law. So we've heard a lot during this session and the previous session, uh, in the last 20 years, there's been a huge increase in the recognition of access to information as a fundamental human right and an enabling right that can allow us to access all our other socioeconomic rights, which was demonstrated very nicely by our colleague from India. And with that has come an increase in adoption of laws. And we've heard today that Africa has been quite slow in that particular process. But it's starting to get much better. And you've heard today that in the last year, there has been five new laws passed in Africa. But there's also been other really positive developments. Uh, Rwanda has made a commitment to pass a law by the end of the year. Kenya and Morocco have both passed constitutional provisions providing access to information rights. And Uganda has finally implemented regulations to allow its law to be used in practice. Another important step that Africa has taken uh, in recognition of the importance of access to information is to expand the role of the Special Rapporteur, whose, whose role was previously restricted to freedom of expression, um, but it's now been extended to include access to information. And as Mukulani just told you, her experience in speaking to states about why they don't have access to information laws has shown that one of the key challenges that states in Africa face is a lack of expertise and a lack of finance to develop a law in the absence of having an African model law that speaks to the particular African context and to the uniqueness um, of the rights and the position in this country, on this continent, sorry. So as a result of that, Commissioner Tokula asked the Centre for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria to convene a meeting of experts in October last year uh, to discuss the need for the law, what benefits might come from having a model law, and also to discuss minimum standards that would need to be included in such a law. Um, so that experts meeting involved people from all over Africa, many of whom are in the room today. Uh, also there was experts from India, and people who had worked on the model OAS law um, for, Afri for Americas. Um, 
out of that meeting, it was decided that a law would be beneficial, uh, and a minimum set of standards were developed that would need to be included in any such law. Commissioner Tukula then went to the African Commission uh, and asked them to authorise uh, the drafting of a model law, and they did so uh, by adopting a resolution. So this process of this model law has, will hopefully at some point have the stature uh, of the African Commission. It's planned that it will go before the African Commission for adoption in April next year. So based on the minimum standards that were developed, uh, a drafting committee was selected, uh, which involves myself and a colleague Chantal Kissoon from the South African Human Rights Commission. And we worked with a small panel of the experts who were at the first meeting and went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth with drafts. Um, and I tell you this not to bore you, but just to let you know that it's important to realise this model law is not the work of two people or three people. Um, it's had input from all over Africa, from the west, from the south, from the north, from central, from eastern, um, trying to take into account all the different contexts that exist in this continent. So we now have a draft model law. It's out for public consultation. We had a consultation in um, Maputo in June. Uh, another one was held in Nairobi just a couple of weeks ago. There's one upcoming in Dhaka for those of you who are based in the West uh, from the 10th to the 12th of October. And there'll be one held in Cairo either later this year or early next year. At the consultations, we're having people from government, people from human rights commissions or other independent commissions. Uh, we're having members of civil society and we're asking everyone to tell us, to give us your criticisms, your comments, your any kind of feedback you have on the law. Uh, and we're also allowing written feedback uh, up until the 31st of October. Thereafter, experts will make a decision uh, on what should be included in the law as a result of the feedback. And a final law will be drafted and presented to the African Commission, along with implementation guidelines. We've heard a lot about the need to focus on implementation as well as law, um, and there will be a comprehensive set of implementation guidelines that will accompany the law. When we submit to the African Commission, we'll also be submitting as an anxious all the feedback that we've received at our consultations and in writing. And so we really encourage you uh, to get involved in this process. The only way we can make sure it's truly representative of all the African needs is to ensure that people get involved and make submissions. Um, there are drafts available in English, French, Portuguese. We're working on an Arabic version. Um, and we need you to tell us whether it would work in your country as it exists now, whether it would be implemented in terms of timelines, whether it would be implemented in terms of, you know, are you in a common law or a civil law context? Does it make sense in your context? Would it work with your other laws? What is it missing? Um, how might it be used or abused in your country? Um, so I'm really hoping that you will visit <laughs> the Centre for Human Rights website and download a copy of the law and have a look at it and give us your feedback. Um, and also feedback is welcome. I know there are many colleagues in the room who are not from Africa. Uh, but we're also welcoming feedback from around the world. A colleague from India could um, certainly give us some lessons, I'm sure, uh, on what's happened in their particular context. Uh, so, <coughs> that's me. Yeah, I so I would just encourage you to please make submissions um, and review the law and give us your thoughts. Thank you.